Hey everyone, and welcome to AWS On Air Lockdown. Today I'm joined by Hamanshu and Ross. Did the both of you want to kind of introduce yourself real quick and tell everyone who you are and why you're here? Yeah, sure. Hey Kyle, uh, and hey everyone. My name is Hamanshu. I lead the team of our worldwide security specialists uh, dedicated to AWS native security services. And I'm Ross Warren. I'm the product SA on Security Lake. Um, I've been here at AWS just over five years and looking forward to this conversation. Great. Thank you. And I'm Kyle Dickinson. I am your host of AWS On Air Lockdown. Now, allow myself to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a senior security solution architect that specializes in threat detection and incident response. And that is a mouthful to say. Uh, but prior to AWS, um, you know, I specialized in threat detection, incident response, even taught uh, cloud security and come from a field of uh, blue teaming. And so I'm really passionate about this subject of incident response and threat detection, but also just overall this whole security topic. And what are we doing here at AWS On Air Lockdown? Well, my goal is to make this topic of security on AWS as approachable as possible for anyone that wants to learn about security on AWS. I'm also gonna be highlighting different security services, different ways to secure yourself while using AWS, be it identity, data protection. Um, we have infrastructure security. Uh, we will be having talks on the security reference architecture. So the topic is security. It's most likely gonna be spoken about here on lockdown. Now, if you do have a topic that you, the community would like to hear about, you're more than welcome to reach out to us on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You can even email me and I'll go and put that at the end of today's show. So you can reach out. And if you have any questions, that would be awesome too, because this is here to allow everyone to learn more about security on AWS, coming from experts within AWS and also members of our community. Now, what I'll be going to do is talking about the different content that AWS releases. And I'm really excited about this because there's so much content that we release. And I go through our open source tools and blog posts. Did you know that uh, we have a AWS security blog post? Yeah. So for content that is on the AWS security blog, I'll be highlighting a few articles um, that I feel like um, would really help those in um, you know, just want to highlight these, but also some really cool tools that our consultants, solution architects are coming out with. And today I'm going to start with the different open source tools. Now, all of these links will be included in the chat and the show notes. So don't feel like um, if you're just listening in via the podcast, you're going to be missing out. Just go to the show notes and you'll have links to these resources as well. So nothing to it, but to get started. So I want to first talk about the Automated Security Helper. This was created by senior security consultant Daniel Begemer. And this is an all-in-one code security scanner which can help detect application flaws in cloud security misconfigurations using things like CloudFormation NAG, CDK NAG, and Chekhov. But check this out. It also supports Git, Jupyter Notebooks, JavaScript, Node.js, Golang, Bash, C Sharp, Java, CloudFormation, and Terraform. So uh, one of the common questions I get from folks is, okay, how do we make sure that we're not to uh, introduce risk into our environment uh, before we deploy it? Well, if you're using infrastructure as code, using something like Automated Security Helper, or I believe they call it ASH for short, uh, is a way to get started. It will highlight those security misconfigurations uh, to help prevent uh, introducing unnecessary risk into your environment. Another one, if you've ever wanted to know what the security posture of your AWS accounts are and you're using AWS organizations, Mike Virgilio created a way for you to use Prowler to evaluate your accounts across your AWS organization. So that's pretty neat. So Prowler is a pretty capable tool um, and integrates with Security Hub as well to generate findings. So if you need to understand, you know, what resources might not be necessarily um, configured to a best practice, uh, this could provide insight to that. And being able to do that at scale across your AWS organization is another awesome way to be able to do that. And last but not least, for open source tools, 
Terraform EC2 Image Builder Container Hardening Pipeline. Now, this was made by Mike St. Cross, who's also a security consultant, noticing a security theme here, right? So this is the first example of a Terraform-based container hardening pipeline that uses EC2 Image Builder. And just a quick background of EC2 Image Builder, it allows you to bake Amazon machine images for usage across your organization, and you can actually share those images out with a resource access manager. And it continuously replaces insecure container images by leveraging Inspector's Elastic Container Repository scanning feature and also uses event bridge triggers. So I'll include those links in the chat so everyone can reference those. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about what we have on the security blog. So first, we have a recap of the security, identity, and compliance sessions of AWS reInvent 2022. If you weren't at reInvent 2022 <clears throat> or didn't catch the live streams, uh, this is a nice recap of all the different security-related sessions that were the highlight of the conference. I'm partially biased because I had my own presentations at reInvent, but uh, this is a great way to um, get the uh, takeaways from reInvent in regards to the security space. Now, I am actually very excited about this one. As someone that read the original uh, security incident response guide when I was working prior to AWS and bringing in this whole cloud security thing, there's been an update to the AWS security incident response guide that includes more prescriptive guidance, including operationalizing security uh, individuals. Uh, it's a great read. I recommend that if you're just starting with this incident response or security operations center journey and moving to AWS, this is one of those we should definitely read this type of papers uh, because it'll help develop the foundations of security for your organization. And that also includes the cloud adoption framework security perspective and the well-architected framework security pillar. So those are great fundamental resources uh, that I continuous, uh, continuously uh, reference on a regular basis. And then also uh, we have a blog post on how to revoke federated user active uh, AWS session. So if you're responding to a security event and you need to make sure that no one has access or a particular user doesn't have access to your AWS account while you're doing your investigation, uh, this blog post gives you the steps on how to go about revoking that federated user's active session. Now, the difference between an IAM user and a federated session is, well, a federated session is using an identity provider, be it uh, Ping ID or Okta, or whatever other uh, solution you may be using for single sign-on and tells you how to contain that while your investigation is uh, being conducted. And then last, but certainly not least, there is the workshops created by the AWS Customer Incident Response Team. So what happens when you take incident responders that support customers during active security events and give them a means of being help, being able to help customers further go through on how to respond to a security event? Well, these five workshops are that way, and they will go over common security events such as um, ransomware on that impacts data residing in S3, um, exposed IAM credentials, and a couple others. So I recommend taking a look at those. And again, all of these links will be included in the show notes for today. But finally, for what we are here for, and I am very, very excited to be talking about this because I have been waiting for this to come out. As someone who was responsible for creating visibility into a company's AWS uh, environment, I was running around like I was on fire. And this service just simplifies all of that. What I'm talking about is Amazon Security Lake. And that's why I have Himanshu and Ross on today to talk about Amazon Security Lake. Now, what is Security Lake and how is it going to be helping our customers? But more specifically, let's think about the, you know, the tiles of the world that had to set up this visibility and logging pipeline uh, across all of our AWS environments. Yeah. Um... Thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction, Kyle. And uh, I, you know, we're, we're equally excited. Uh, Ross and I have been engaged with the service team in helping them uh, discover some of the customer requirements. And with all things Amazon, 
And this is a service where we actually closely listen back uh, to our customers' key pain points. Uh, so before we go into like what the service is and what it does, I just want to provide some insights. And maybe this is something that might be relevant um, and listeners uh, might as well empathize with some of the key pain points um, and challenges that we heard uh, from our customers. First and foremost, we uh, totally recognize, and I think you mentioned this uh, in your past experiences as well, that uh, enterprise-wide IT security data collection is a challenge. Um, you know, I mean, we're talking about various different sources, we're talking about various different environments. Uh, obviously, you know, cloud is one of them and AWS cloud uh, is, is one of them, but there could be hybrid environments uh, or could be on-premise applications and even enterprise SaaS applications. So how do you bring all this data together in one place? And security teams do need to access that data at some point uh, and have uh, you know, access to that so that they can uh, get some uh, data points and, and take actions on those. So you During mentioned a bunch of different like technologies you know, from applications, um, you know, the different vendors, different applications that a customer may be using, uh, maybe even an application that they've created themselves. Uh, you know, all of those types of log formats come out in different ways, right? And um, again, going back to the previous Kyle days, um, one of the big things that uh, could be a hassle is mapping the different keys and values uh, to provide easy context uh, to be able to search data and make data provide me answers. Right. Um, so I can answer the, you know, ask a qu data, the question of who did what, where, when, and how, but then also additional questions. Right. And then provide Absolutely. me more context around that. Exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and we noticed that as well. Um, you know, customers told us that not only is a growing volume of data a challenge, um, and as you can imagine, you know, uh, cloud brings its advantages of providing you know a lot of visibility and a lot of verbose log information uh, but that also brings in the challenge of proprietary and or different schema formats you know i think to your point if you're uh, parsing network logs you know you might need ip addresses dns entries urls whereas if you are going into specific application logs you know that might not include the same schema formats uh, so we do understand that and we receive that as feedback as well. And, and part of our vision for the service was to first take a step back and help establish an open schema or an open format schema uh, that we launched uh, as an initiative last year at Reinforce, uh, which was called the Open Cybersecurity Schema Format or OCSF. Um, so that is uh, the foundation of uh, Amazon Security Lake, um, you know, underlying foundation of uh, Security Lake. You know, if uh, just to dive a little bit deeper on that, you mentioned different kinds of logs, but even think about bringing different DNS log types in, right? Route 53, Windows DNS, Bind DNS, Cisco, right? Even just trying to normalize all of those was a challenge that Kyle and I faced many, many moons ago. Um, even just trying to figure out what the IP address was across all of those logs and your, your searches and your queries just became this mess of aliases. It could um, be SRC IP or just IP underscore ADDR or right. <laughs> you know, exactly. all sorts of different values. <laughs> and your query right. just became a mess and it wasn't shareable between folks, you know, as we see in more and more enthusiasm around OCSF my vision, my hope, my goal is I write a query, I can now give it to somebody else in either in the GitHub repo or share it with a customer. And it's just going to work. I don't, they don't have to go specifically change it inside, you know, their system that they've got. You know, and right. that's such a big thing too. And I've seen, you know, more and more security, um, you know, folks that they want to share queries uh, that they've found useful. And a lot of them, they can work, but sometimes you, more times than not, you have to modify it based on maybe like uh, your schema or the way that you just have things mapped or stored um, or separated. And, you know, I, I, you know, I will admit that I'm the first person to say, is there already a query that will tell me this answer already out there? And then it's like, okay, I got to modify this part of the query. And then, oh, our naming is different over here. And so it sounds like uh, one, this is, going to simplify um, querying data, but it's also going to enable 
um, you know, folks to be able to share these queries. Maybe we should even have like a query repository or something. Great point, yeah. Kyle. Um, yeah. I oh, had did the, I actually bring something up? <laughs> yes. I had the customer incident response team. Um, they did a whole Athena bootstrap project and had a ton of great queries across VPC flow, CloudTrail, Route 53. And I worked with Ryan there over the last six months. He converted all of those to OCSF and I'm already sharing them with customers and they will actually be up on the, they're, they're public now, but I'm getting them linked to the Security Lake documentation um, and I even write some scripts to automate all of those. So really a lot of good work. And I believe in sharing those queries just going to make us all better in the security realm. Yeah. Rising tide floats all ships, I believe the saying is. <laughs> if you yeah. So, so that, that is at the core of, uh, you know, Security Lake. Um, and the other, the other thing that we learned from customers was the challenge that goes into actually being in control or owning the security data themselves. Um, you know, what we noticed was that when it comes to performing analysis or analytics on the data that they're collecting, at times, you know, it's being sent to the application where they're performing that analytics. And, and most of the times, you know, customer and the security teams are left with managing storage costs or managing retention costs, or, you know, basically not being able to enrich that data because now it's gone into some third party application where they don't have control for that. So really the underlying principle uh, and you know, our goal was to number one, centralize all of that data in one place, both from native AWS sources as well as non-AWS sources. Secondly, optimize and normalize it in this uh, standard format. Um, you know, in our case, um, you know, with the OCSF normalization, so we will normalize the native AWS logs automatically into that format. And thirdly, give customers control of their own data, which is you know, creating um, an S3 Lake formation in their own AWS account, literally at the click of a few buttons, and then have the customers either use their existing tools or provide them flexibility to add whatever analytics they want to add on that data. So I wanna, Hamas, you said in a few button clicks, and I, I don't want to minimize that all. You know, you heard Kyle say that it, it's really hard to bring all of these logs from all these different places into one place. Um, there's custom workflows, there's Kinesis, there's all of these things that you may have now or you're building. And I'm not joking, with Security Lake, you can get all of your VPC flow in four button clicks. Um, you want to see a demo? I'll show you later. From reach out to me. Um, and customers are amazed that they don't have to go write all these custom scripts. They don't have to manage or look at, um, you know, all these lambdas doing all these things or be worried that the data is not actually flowing. In Security Lake, I'm handling that all for you. You don't even have to touch it. Absolutely. Um, and, and this is really the power of the service. Um, you know, I think the most important aspect here is that you know, if you look at um, the cost that goes into orchestrating all of this stuff, first and foremost, you need to enable these logs uh, in AWS, which is what Security Lake eliminates. It's based on the same exact principles where some of our other security services are, for example, God Duty, uh, you know, or Detective, where you don't have to enable logs to get that value. All you have to do is enable the service, which is the Amazon Security Lake in this case, in your AWS account, and it automatically builds a back channel with the required log and telemetry for the native AWS log sources, which it's integrated with. So for example, you know, all the network information is in flow logs, VPC and DNS, all the API activities in CloudTrail. So in the fullness of time, we'll continue to include additional AWS log sources, but currently in preview, we already have five major key AWS log sources uh, integrated with the service, including Security Hub, which also brings in, you know, the aggregated security findings. And again, cannot overemphasize that do not need to add any other operationalization or enable logging other than just enabling Amazon Security Lake. It's one of those one, two click moves. I see what she did. And uh, <laughs> we have a question of just asking, uh, you know, what does product essay mean, Ross? What, do, what, what is your role? 
What is my role? What do you do? What would you say you do around here? So at, at AWS, SA means solution architect. And so previously, I was a security specialist solution architect, a mouthful, like Kyle said a little bit earlier. Um, but since historically, I've been a log geek for many years before coming to AWS. I saw the opportunity to move on to a service team and help really build and shape and talk to our customers. And so product SA, um, jokingly, I say I'm the PM, but I don't have to worry about the pricing or worry about, you know, driving um, and deciding on features and functionality. I talk to the customers. Um, I get to listen to the customers, hear what they want, and then tell the PM and engineering that, hey, customer wants to have X. Um, it's been a great year plus talking to some really large customers. Um, and I love being a product SA, seeing how the sausage is made, talking to the engineers who are actually doing all of the coding, um, helping them understand and fixing things. And um, they've said, I shouldn't be a programmer, which um, was I, I funny. would agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, you know, and I know we, we joke um, around that, you know, and we have folks that ask, well, is security like a, a seam? And I know just to, you know, mess with Ross, we say, oh, how's that seam going? Uh, but it's anything but a seam, and it really does uh, enable logging. I wish this was a service that was available when I was responsible for all this logging stuff I had to do. Because I'm just thinking about, you know, with VPC flow logs and the rate that they come in, how could you get those into a sim uh, efficiently? And it was like, okay, maybe through Firehose, but then how do you scale the enablement of enabling those VPC flow logs? And there's some great references now that uh, use automation uh, to do that. But back when I was thrown into a room of like 15 very smart people and saying, hey, uh, you know, we're going to AWS uh, and Kyle, you're responsible for security. I'm going, all right, let's do this. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to, to your point, Kyle, Security Lake is not a sim. Um, it is really about the management and orchestration of getting logs to a centralized place, right? We all have that checkbox that needs to be centralized logging. Um, and we are really enabling that. Um, there's a huge partner play here. We work with a lot of different partners for how do I now use that data in the data lake? Um, and those have been some very interesting conversations. Now, which is, you which is where, yeah, sorry. So you mentioned, uh, you know, it's one, two click and centralized logging. And when I first came across this whole centralized logging methodology, it was to help scale logging strategies. And now with, um, well, enabling security lake on an account, and across an organization is simple. This is kind of removing that having to play catch up. So when a new account is created within your AWS organization, uh, you know, the um, logging engineers, you know, security operations center doesn't need to worry about going back and enabling the different logging. It's, right. oh, we got a new account. Great. It's already being ingested or at Absolutely. least the data yeah. is being sent over here. So if something were to occur, or we do need to review um, activity, we have it. We don't have to worry about, oh, there's going to be, you know, 50 accounts spun up this week. So how are we going to get our logging set up? Yeah. So just like all of our other uh, security services, um, you know, Amazon Security Lake is an AWS account based service and uh, it's fully natively integrated with uh, Amazon or AWS organization construct, uh, which means that it helps with the multi account management. Uh, you know, security teams can designate or delegate a centralized management account from where it can become very easy to activate as well as uh, onboard or offboard member accounts uh, for, from one single place. Uh, additionally, it also, you know, brings one level up, which is, uh, you know, organizations is a regional construct. Uh, so we've uh, also added features like cross-regional aggregation. Uh, so we understood from customers that, you know, they are today orchestrating all this stuff, not only at the AWS account level, but at multiple accounts. And like you said, you know, if they're adding more accounts or adding more resources to those accounts, they want this automatically to be enabled. Uh, and additionally, if they are using multiple regions, uh, they want this to be either aggregated per region or cross region as well. So all of that flexibility is available in the service. 
Well, that's great. Um, now, when so I know one of the big things that uh, comes up is you know the uh, so since we are now storing the data in our own environment, um, what do we? What kind of flexibility do we have to kind of lower costs as far as the cost of storage goes? Because I know that has been one of the the primary uh, questions. Is well, we have a lot of data. Um, how can we make sure that recently assessed data, access data assessed, um, is highly available um, or just there? But the you know data that doesn't get touched too often um, isn't going to cost us the same as the uh, more frequently accessed data. Right. So, yeah, you know the one of the personas that we look at when we're talking about security lake is the data custodian. They're the one turning on logging. They're the one who is just making sure the logging is happening. And so in the console, um, we've taken all of the same S3 storage classes that you know and love today. And this data custodian is in the security lake console and can set up those ex exact same things. It's the same API calls in the back end. We're just making it easy so you don't have to bop over to the S3 console and figure out where your buckets are. Um, so it makes it a lot easier just to manage all of that, Kyle. Okay. Now, yeah. how does the data get into security? Like, you know, we mentioned one, two, click, uh, poof, there it is. Uh, but really, how does it so, get there? Three different ways. We kind of hinted at the AWS services, and Haman Shemant mentioned some of them, and the way that they come in the same way as guard duty, you know, and detective. We're doing it on the back plane, the customer the data custodian, to use the same persona, doesn't actually have to go hit all of those accounts. We do the ETL to OCSF for you. We manage all that. Within five minutes, you're you're ready to go, start seeing VPC flow. Um, I hinted at partners. Um, if you go to the Security Lake website, you'll see there's lots of partner listed, listed. And each one of those logos means they've actually had to prove to us they can put data in the data lake in OCSF or take data out. I know we're talking about data's in right now. Um, more coming. There was like 35 announced at reInvent, but Ella, our partner manager, has got lists and lists of more people she's talking to every single day. Or you can actually, if you love logs, you love doing ETL, you can actually write, you know, you've got a log inside that is just specific to you. You could write the process, write the ETL um, to then put it into the data lake in OCSF. So there you register the subscriber, um, sorry, you register the source in date in um, in the data lake and we take care of all those cross account permissions for you. Um, more to come, still looking at other ways to get data in there and watch that space. Right, uh, I mean, I, I included, uh, you know, the documentation page uh, includes some of this information as well. Um, as Ross mentioned, so does the website. But I think in, in summary, there are three key elements of how data can uh, be brought in. First and foremost is our own AWS log sources. So we are integrating that natively. Uh, we're taking away the burden and the cost associated with enabling that logging, you know, orchestrating that. Uh, and or um, you know operationalizing that or normalizing that. So we are automatically integrating those log sources and normalizing them into OCSF format as well. The second big category is our partners. Um, so these are either you know your gateway firewalls or your endpoint detection and response products or uh, uh, you know uh, enterprise SaaS applications uh, that might be there. And then the third category, as Ross mentioned, is custom sources. You know, we, we understand some of our customers are writing their own applications and they might have their own logging uh, requirements. So in all three categories, um, these are all referenced as sources in the service. Customers will have the ability to either use uh, the integrations that are available uh, to add in these um, third party uh, independent software vendors and their integrations and our partners or add their own custom sources as well to the service. And since OCSF is open sourced, um, it is my vision, my hope that there's gonna be more and more mappers and examples of bringing custom data into OCSF or converting it to OCSF showing up in the GitHub repos. Starting to see some flavors already. Um, and so that's cool that everybody's starting to share. Sharing is caring. It can be fun. I'll give you mm -hmm. some when you have none. I think that's how the, the riddle goes or the song. Now, what is it that 
um, enables the customers to be able to really, um, you know, analyze the data, you know, because, you know, data is just data until you do something actionable with it. Um, what are some of the ways that like, you know, using AWS services that the customer would be able to, you know, just kind of go forth like as soon as possible if they were going, um, you know, I don't have a SIM, but I want to be able to query this data. Um, how can they do that? Yeah. Uh, so really what's happening is that as soon as the service is enabled um, and, and these log sources come in, um, you know, the second basic basic construct in the service is around subscribers, which is where all do you want to subscribe that data? Uh, you know, when we said that we want to give customers control of that data, we were really uh, serious about that. And uh, we also uh, identified during the setup of the service, like things like, how long do you want to retain that data and how much of that data needs to be, you know, in hot storage so that you can send it to your security analyst tools uh, or security analysis, you know, for doing live querying, et cetera. So those options are all set up by the customers themselves. And then when it comes to subscribers, they can, you know, go to their Athena console right away and start querying because behind the scenes, what's happening is that we're actually creating an S3 lake formation in customers' AWS accounts uh, and then creating the appropriate partitions and those objects uh, in standard parquet format that are now available for either direct access from S3 or for query with data in place, which means without moving that data anywhere, you can actually run uh, active queries. So our subscribers and our analytical tools uh, will leverage those two methods of accessing that data. And I'll let uh, Ross chime in on, on some of the other details. Saw <laughs> me itching there, Ross chime in. <laughs> um, I, I just shaking in his seat. <laughs> I don't want to, we can't minimize how my, what he just said. If you think about historically how you put data in, a, in S3 buckets and then you had to go Google how to figure out how to make a crawler how to make a, a lake formation template, how to do cross account access if you're getting the data from to another bucket. Um, think about all the hours you needed to spend to do that. Kyle and I probably have done that multiple times because you forget the minute you do it. Um, as soon as data, whether it's those AWS logs, whether it's the partner logs that Hamanchi talked about, or even any of those custom logs you're building, um, you can pivot to Athena and start querying those right away. And that's what I'm seeing kind of now during preview is that's exactly immediately what customers doing. They want to see what OCSF is about. They want to see their data and they pivot right there. Some customers socks just use Athena and love Athena and dive into that. But we are coordinating so much on the back end that historically you've had to go figure out how to do and screw it up, fix it again. Oh, I mistyped this. All right. They're just, a, a random process of that. I believe they call that learning by doing, Ross. Learning by <laughs> mistakes. It's tactically just... failing. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Hamanchu then talked about subscribers. And so Athena is pretty much a subscriber, right? I'd, I'd like to see patterns where the SOC team has their own account and they are then doing cross account queries into the Athena that Security Lake is running and owning. So that's a great pattern I'm trying to help customers get towards. But open search, open search is, you know, one other native tool at AWS and there's already um, built in integrations with some of the projects inside open search. Um, I just saw somebody on our Slack channel internally who is making now open search dashboards um, that I've got to get to them after this call. Um, and we're working Content for coming out soon. <laughs> integrations with Detective. Um, and I'm looking for somebody internally to help me with like SageMaker. SageMaker knows how to get data out of S3 and Athena. So I think those are some really cool integrations. Now that I've got this normalized, just big chunk of data sitting there, what can I now find inside all of that signal? You um, know what I you know, I think you also kind of uncovered uh, one of the common issues is, um, you know, before data lakes or now a security lake, um, it was kind of a battle of who gets access to the log source for ingestion. And you'd have developers saying, well, we want to get this data for operational use cases. And then you'd have security teams saying, well, we need it for security and understanding if there's a security event occurring. And then, you know, they would say, well, give us access to 
your security, uh, you know, logging tool and security would say, no, uh, uh, uh-uh. uh, um, but then you get the, you know, developers saying, well, we don't have visibility into our environment. And so it kind of, you know, you had the butting of heads of who gets the data and because the data is residing, you know, in S3 and the security lake, it doesn't really matter who gets access to the, what I'll say, the, the, the water hose first. Um, you know, the water hose is going into a puddle and everyone can drink from the puddle now. Yeah, trademark yeah. that, by the way, if I hear any of you using that. <laughs> I like everyone have access to the data. And that's kind of how historically, like, you know, everyone's got access to the data or it's a complete silo as you were kind of hinting at in that scenario security lake um as far as subscribers go right i can actually say that my sim is only gonna get cloud trail or only gonna get you know cloud trail and route 53 and i can say all right developers you're gonna have access to everything and so the data custodian is picked that name's picked for a reason they are now controlling who has access to that data yeah you can give access to a whole bunch of people but now they're going after the same data whether it's a spark job whether it's a sim whether it's open search they're all just using that same data in some controlled fashion right and and just to i think close that out uh, and tying it back to your original point uh, kyle which was like you know we recognize that customers are already using security incident event monitoring tools or you know orchestration and automation tools like soar platforms etc so we've given customers the full flexibility on whatever analytics they want to apply on that data to leverage it. But at the same time, I think what we really wanted to offset was the operationalization that goes in, in as we say, you know, keeping humans away from the security data, you know, because securing this data, having the right privileges and access controls was a massive challenge as well, as we heard from customers, you know, uh, rather than having 50 different buckets spread around, and then managing policies for those or you know disparate data sources and managing security access to those now you have a subscriber which you can define the flexible choices of what all data needs to go into that subs- subscriber and then each subscriber has a unique amazon resource name as an arm and then you can fine green the access controls you can you know use your own customer managed keys for encrypting that data and then, as we say, you know, follow the least privileged access and keep humans away from that data. And then let the analytics value come in from the integrated tools where uh, the security analysts spend their time anyways. The free, oh, sorry, I was just thinking about the time where I had um, probably about 600 different S3 buckets just for cloud trail logs. <laughs> and uh, then, hey, centralized logging is the way to go. OK, great. Let's do that. Um, and so, yeah. But also removing, you know, humans away from the data. That's a big, big thing. And one of the common questions I get is, well, what happens if, you know, data is deleted and we needed to search it? Well, in S3, if data is deleted, it's gone. There is no recycle bin. And the fact that security like is adding like this abstract layer um, to the raw data and making it so uh, no one can accidentally, you know, delete the data. Um, is it's huge but still being able to enable the ability to leverage that data you know we hear right. um, a lot in security world where um, oh well you're stifling innovation well there's this new i would say effort to turn security organizations more into proactive enablers um, or what i say bouncer to bodyguard um, you know instead of being uh, you know, saying yes or no, or yes or no, or yeah, come in or no, get out. Um, it's, hey, we're going on adventures. Um, but <laughs> if your adventure is going to take you into a lava pit, uh, we're going to stop you before you get into the lava pit and say, hey, let's go over to this, you know, pond instead. See what I did there? I tied in lake formation and <laughs> secure lake there. Ha! But uh, yeah, abstracting the users from the data uh, and that abstract layer is really cool. So Kyle, you mentioned secured reference architecture. Um, Security Lake is a brand new service. You know, we're working through this, but um, stay tuned. Security Lake and the guidance we've kind of been talking about um, will be in the security reference architecture very, very soon. Um, Folks listening in, 
If you haven't seen the Secure Reference Architecture, great document to read, great place to start thinking about setting up your different accounts and what they do. Um, highly recommended. Yeah. The, you know, the service is in preview right now. Um, I can't emphasize that, you know, this is the best time for our customers to go in and try out the service. Uh, what that means is that there is no pricing associated with the service itself. It's available in seven of our AWS regions um, that are highlighted in the documentation. Uh, so you can go to your AWS console today and, and activate the service, you know, try out the integrations with uh, various different sources and subscribers. Um, and, you know, reach out to your AWS account teams if you need us to dive deeper and, and you know, provide us feedback. And you'll probably get Himanshu or I on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The email alias goes directly to Ross and Himanshu at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but that would be yet. pretty funny if it was. We can always make that happen. <laughs> yeah. No, we uh, we foresee, um, you know, a lot of uh, innovation coming out of this, um, especially because, you know, the underlying idea was to give customers control of that data. Um, so, you know, um, we're already seeing ideas where customers are thinking of not only bringing their workforce uh, logs or, you know, enterprise application logs, but maybe also like their consumer logs and then start building, you know, um, additional analytics and correlations on top of that, because now they do have access to all of that data and control of what they can do with it. You know, they can enrich it with additional analytics uh, and insights or add their own ETL on that. Um, more importantly, leverage some of our AI ML services like SageMaker and, you know, influence uh, some of that uh, on that data as well. Uh, so we, we definitely foresee, you know, customers, um, you know, benefiting from not only cost and operationalization, but also being on the curve of innovation when it comes to what they can do with that security data now. Talking to customers, they are always pushing that. Can I have this log? Can I have this log? So we are working with multiple different fronts to get there, to bring them that value, whether it's a security log or as Samanchu hinted at, you know, some other log that maybe we didn't think about, but makes sense in their world for correlations. That is wonderful. And I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, where Security Lake goes and excited to hear the different stories from uh, those that are responsible for bringing visibility into their environments, but then also just, you know, the third party integrations that come out uh, the community sharing different ways um, to query the data to provide um, answers to questions, and just I'm I'm very excited. You know me. I've been it. You know, I wouldn't say foaming out the mouth because that's unappealing, but I've been very very excited. Um, you know, for security like to come out, and um, now that it's in preview, um, you know, I've been getting to play around with it and uh, query my data to provide answers of the goofy things that I'm doing. So with that, before I let you two go, uh, there's always one question that I have to ask folks. Are you ready for this question? And uh, Himanshu and Ross, uh, this is for both of you to answer. I'm scared now. He didn't preface uh, it with it's, <laughs> uh, it's fine. <laughs> if you had to choose, would you rather have to fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses. And for those watching live right now, uh, feel free to drop your preference. Again, would you have to fight, would you rather have to fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? I, think I know the my answer. I would go the 100 because um, my legs are pretty strong and I start just start booting them all <laughs> and kicking them around. <laughs> That's off the I ground. will... Uh... I will not underestimate the multiplier effect here, so I will go with the one, uh, <laughs> you know, source of. Uh, <laughs> well, if if the hundred hundred ducks b abide by kung fu movie rules, only one can attack me at a time, right? <laughs> That's very true. We I'm, got a couple I'm, folks saying that they would go with the one as well. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm on board with Amanshu with uh, with the. The one uh, horse-sized duck that would just—I um, uh, feel like it would be easier to manage because if they don't abide by, you know, uh, martial arts movies, then <laughs> you're going to get swarmed. And then once they take you to the ground, it's game over. I've seen like how these zombie movies work, mm -hmm. and all these other types of movies, and it doesn't work out that way. Yes, 
Or in Incredibles, when Mr. Incredible got all those sticky things to him, right? There you go. But what if you could conquer the horse-sized duck and then fly it around like a griffin? Ooh. We need to come up with a battle strategy and talk about it next episode. (laughs) Sounds great. (laughs) All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, If you have any questions about Amazon Security Lake, please feel free to reach out, and I will poke uh, Hamanshu or Ross. And feel free to hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I've been posting comments in LinkedIn. And my Twitter is right there. Thank you, everyone, for watching the first, but certainly not last, episode of AWS On Air Lockdown. Make sure to check out AWS On Air. That airs every Friday where we talk about new service releases and cool things. uh, And I'm sometimes on it. So there you go. All right. Everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me.